All right, good morning. Good to see all of you this morning. Open your Bible, if you would, to Philippians chapter 4. Philippians chapter 4. Thank you. Good to be back. There's no place like home. Let's just click my shoes together like Dorothy. Um, <clears throat> yes, several. I may have more to say about that later. Um, I want to start off with a, a prayer in just a moment, but before I do that, I want to say thank you to my dad for teaching for me last week while I was away. Uh, I've not gone back and watched the video, um, but I'm sure I will, so I can, you know, tell him all the areas that he excelled. You don't tell your dad that he didn't do well. Um, somebody who knows how to shut the pump off to the baptistry, would you mind going and doing that for me? Thank you. So as not to... Uh, you know, if I went back there and, and tried to do that, I know how, but with the microphone, you'd hear all the groaning and the, and, oh, oh, let's see if I can get through this tight hole. You don't want to hear all that. Thanks, Todd. Um, and the other thing that I want to mention is uh, Sister Doris Carter mentioned to me uh, just a few minutes ago that on Thursday, she's going to be having a procedure to put, uh, she called it a watchman in her heart. I've never heard of that. Sounds like maybe it's some kind of a pacemaker kind of related idea, something to help with her heart rhythm. And uh, so she's going to be having that done on Thursday. And um, our own Dr. Ben Holmes is going to be performing that procedure. So we want to pray for Doris as well as for Dr. Ben. All right. Well, let's go ahead and uh, start with a prayer, and then we'll get into our study. Our Father, we rejoice in this good day. We're thankful for everyone who is here today. We're thankful to have visitors with us, and we pray your blessings upon them as they travel. We are thankful for the blessing of godly fathers today as our nation celebrates Father's Day, and as we think about those men and uh, fathers and grandfathers and uh, others who have been strong influences in our lives for good. We pray your blessings on our sister Doris this week as she is facing this heart procedure. We pray for our brother Ben as he performs that procedure. And we pray that all will go well for both of them and that our sister can recover quickly. We pray your blessings on our study this morning and we pray in Jesus' name, amen. Well, I did not, uh, thank you, Todd. I, I did not send out a lesson ahead of time for today, and um, some of you had, had asked me, hey, did you send out an email on this? And I, I had not done that, and there's, there's two reasons. One of them is, uh, obviously, I had camp last week, and I just ran out of time, but the other reason, and maybe the bigger reason I ran out of time, is because I wasn't exactly sure how I wanted to do this lesson. Um, I, I know this is a familiar passage. And I just wasn't sure what, how do I want to approach this? And I was indecisive, and uh, then as camp came nearer, I just, I ran out of time. And I need to do better about making a decision. You know, where do you want to eat? I don't know, where do you want to eat? You know, that, that's kind of what I was doing in my mind. So uh, I'm sorry you didn't have anything to prepare for ahead of time, but our study today is, is from Philippians 4, verses 8 and 9. And it's titled, Joy in Mind, because of things that Paul tells us in chapter 4 and verse 8 that he wants us to dwell on. Again, familiar text, but let's read these two verses. Finally, brothers and sisters, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is just, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is commendable, if there is any moral excellence and if there is anything praiseworthy, Dwell on these things. Do what you have learned and received and heard from me and seen in me, and the God of peace will be with you. Paul says some things here about what our minds should dwell on, what our minds should think on. 
Paul has had several things to say about our mind in this book. Go back to chapter 1. In chapter 1 and verse 27... He said, as citizens of heaven, live your life worthy of the gospel of Christ. Then whether I come to see you or if I am absent, I will hear about, that, I will hear about you, that you're standing firm in one spirit, in one accord, or in one mind, contending together for the faith of the gospel. In chapter 2, in verse 2, make my joy complete by being of the same Mind. He talks about a, a unified mind in those verses. In verse 3 of chapter 2, he says, Do nothing out of selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility consider others as more important than yourselves. Some translations render that lowliness of mind. So he talks about the humble mind here in that text. In chapter 2, in verse 20, he's talking about Timothy. And he says of him, I have no one else like-minded who will genuinely care about your interests. There is a genuine mind that is seen in Timothy. And Timothy's mind stands in contrast to those in verse 21, of whom it is said that they all seek their own interests, not those of Jesus Christ. Timothy has a genuine selfless mind, while these others have a selfish mind mind and they only think about their own things and then in chapter 3 and verse 15 he says therefore let all of us who are mature think this way Paul speaks of a mature mind so Paul has had a lot of things to say about our mind in this book and in chapter 4 and verse 8 he tells us about the things that our minds should be thinking on I want to play a little game with you as we begin to consider these things in chapter 4. I'm going to give you some popular expressions that we are all very familiar with. These are, are expressions that come from commercials on television or advertisements that you hear on the radio. I'm going to begin this popular catchphrase or this expression, and I want you to do one of two things. Um, either finish the expression, if that's what it calls for, or number two, name the company that utilizes the expression. Okay? You ready? Okay. Number one, like a good neighbor, State Farm is there. Okay? Now listen, we're not just playing a game. I have a point here, okay? All right. Like a good neighbor, State Farm is there. All right, what company uses this expression? Have it your way. Burger King. They've been using that one for 50 years. Yeah, Burger King. All right? Maybe she's born with it. Maybe it's... Yeah, all the women answer. All the guys are like, ah. Uh. Yeah, Maybelline, all right? Maybe she's born with it. Maybe it's Maybelline. And you can hear that little jingle. Maybe it's Maybelline. Right? You can hear it. Okay. They actually, the company actually, I, in, in my, you know, in all of my research, I, I discovered that they did away with that jingle in 2016. They've replaced it with something else, but you don't know what the new one is, do you? Yeah. Yeah. It, <laughs> yeah. Alan Muller says, I didn't know the first one. Yeah. Well, that's because you don't paint your face, Alan. <laughs> All right, name this company. Better ingredients, better pizza. Papa John's, okay. America runs on Dunkin'. Yeah, Dunkin' Donuts. All right, and then here's, this, here's the last one that I'm going to use. Um, just do it. Nike, yeah. All right. Thousand points to everybody. Good job. All of these advertisement slogans are memorable. They're catchy. Sometimes uh, advertisement slogans rhyme, and that makes it stick into our heads because of the rhyming. Uh, we have heard these for years, some of them even for decades. They're, they're short, they're catchy, they're memorable. 
and we watch a simple 30 second commercial on TV. And if we see the commercial enough, or if we listen to the radio advertisement enough, or we see the, the billboard on the interstate enough, eventually it sticks. And so when it comes time for us to purchase a product, when it's time for us to purchase a pizza, Papa John's is hoping that we will subconsciously think, better ingredients, better pizza. Oh, I should call Papa John's. It's time for me to buy new tennis shoes. Uh, just do it. Oh, yeah, Nike. Right. I'm going to get some Nike shoes. Or, you know, my favorite professional basketball player wears Nike shoes. So I'm going to do that because that's what he does or whatever. So these companies are hoping that their catchphrase will stay in our mind because that will prompt us to think of their brand. Here's the point of that little exercise. What we see affects what we think. If simple 15 to 30 second advertisements on TV can have such a, a strong effect on us, how much more the serious messages that we hear from the culture, from our peers, and ultimately from the devil himself. I don't think I'm telling you anything new when I say that the world that we live in just saturates our minds with inappropriate things. The world is full of filth. Violence, sex, drugs, hatred, bad attitudes, all of these things and more are forced upon us daily through the various forms of media that exist. And these things bring no peace to our minds at all. And that's really what we're after. Did you notice two times here in Philippians chapter 4, the word peace is mentioned. It's mentioned in verse 7. The peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. And then in verse 9, the God of peace will be with you. Notice that. There's the peace of God in verse 7 and the God of peace in verse 9. But so much of what the world offers to us only brings trouble. It only brings worry and anxiety. But if we will think on spiritual things, things that are higher, things that are nobler, as we sing, we elevate our minds beyond all of the disturbing things that we see in this world. Some of you, because of these jingles and these advertisements, you may be brand loyal. You've been buying the same, you know, laundry detergent for 50 years. And, and maybe, you, maybe you have reasons for buying it. You know, you like the way it smells or, or whatever. Um, but sometimes we, we become devoted to brands simply because of these advertisements. A advertising is powerful, isn't it? And, and we see it all around. If you go into the grocery store when it's time to, to get to the, the checkout counter, what, what do they put up high at eye level for grown-ups? What's up there? It's the tabloids, right? It's all the juicy gossip of the day. Why do they put it up high? So the grown-ups see it. If a five-year-old is staring at a tabloid, that, that means nothing to them. So they put that stuff up high. What's down low? The candy. And the little toys, because that's where the children are, right? That isn't coincidental. There's a method to all of this. People study this kind of thing. So these advertisers know what they're doing. And everything that they put out on the television or on the radio has been thought through very carefully so that they can craft their message to reach people in the most effective way. And that's also true for movies, television, uh, shows, and other things that we consume. Not all of which is bad. I'll say more about that in just a moment. All right. So, now that we moved on from our game, let's, let's make a point together. What we consume 
is what we will produce. What we consume is what we will produce. The things that we take in and internalize will one day become the things that come out. They will come out in our words. They will come out in our actions. You've heard the expression, garbage in, garbage out. I was reminded of that expression all last week. When you go to camp, you eat camp food. Do you know what camp food is not? Good. That's what it's not, okay? Three meals a day, every day last week, we ate camp food. Or I think about the school lunches that I ate when I was a kid. Um, it wasn't good. Not only was it not nutritional, I mean, we had pizza and stuff like that that is not considered good by nutritional standards, but it just didn't taste good either. It it wasn't good by taste standards, okay, but it's what we had, and we were hungry, so we ate it. Um, When you eat garbage, when you eat bad stuff, how do you feel? You feel yucky, right? You you don't feel good. I mean, that Five Guys hamburger is great at the moment, but later on, you're like, man, I I don't need to eat that every day. It sure beats a salad, though. (laughs) But I don't want to eat that every day. Garbage in, garbage out. We understand that uh, as it relates to our physical sustenance and, and our physical well-being. But how much more... Is that true with our spiritual well-being? And that's why Paul says in this place and in others that it matters what we think about. It matters what we take in. Go to Romans chapter 8. Paul sets forth a, a, very, uh, a very great contrast here in Romans 8. And he's talking about our minds. He's talking about our our focus, what we pursue. In Romans 8 and verse 5, he says, For those who live according to the flesh have their minds set on the things of the flesh. But those who live according to the Spirit have their minds set on the things of the Spirit. There's the contrast. The flesh versus the Spirit. So in verse 6, he says, Now the mind set on the flesh is death. But the mind set on the spirit is life and peace. You see the same elements from Philippians 4, 8? We talked about peace a moment ago. The mindset of the flesh, verse 7, is hostile to God because it does not submit to God's law. Indeed, it is unable to do so. Those who are in the flesh cannot please God. You, however, are not in the flesh, but in the Spirit, if indeed the Spirit of God lives in you. If anyone does not have the Spirit of Christ, he does not belong to him, and so forth. The contrast is clear. There are those who pursue the carnality, the lust, the passion, the desires of the flesh, and there are those who pursue the things of the Spirit, those who pursue the things that are eternal in their consequence. Look at Matthew chapter 15. This is when the Pharisees come to Jesus and, and they're upset in verse one that the or verse two rather that the disciples are not washing their hands when they eat. And so that's the context that Jesus says what we're about to read. So look at verse 16. Do you still lack understanding, he asked. Don't you realize that whatever goes into the mouth passes into the stomach and is eliminated? But what comes out of the mouth comes from the heart, and this defiles a person. For from the heart come evil thoughts, murders, adulteries, sexual immoralities, thefts, false testimonies, and slander. These are the things that defile a person, but eating with unwashed hands does not defile a person. It's not about what goes in to the mouth, Jesus says. See, I can have that five guys hamburger. 
Jesus says what matters more is what comes out. Whatever goes into the mouth when I'm eating ultimately is of little consequence. What is much more important is what comes out because that which comes out of the mouth came first from where? From the heart. It came from within. So that which was internalized will find its way out. So if in my heart is hatred, bitterness, animosity, it's going to find a way out at some point. And when it does, it's not going to be pretty. It's not going to be righteous either. All of these things that Jesus lists in verse 19, murders, adulteries, sexual immoralities, thefts, false testimonies, slander, and uh, evil thoughts, those things originate within. And then they find their way out. The man who steals did so because his heart said, it's okay. His heart said, this is justified. You need this. You should do this. The man who commits adultery, it's not just the outward act. There's an inward element to this that is involved first, okay? All of these things that make their way to the outside had their genesis on the inside. So the point that I'm making in this is the things that we consume, the messages that we consume, the messages we take in, regardless of their source, but the messages that we consume become things that are internalized. It affects the way we feel. It affects the way we think. And when those bad messages are internalized and it has an effect on our thinking, then that thinking will produce a fruit that comes from the root within. All right? Kyle with baby in hand. This, this is going to be an interesting, you know, you're like that guy at the baseball game recently who was holding the baby and he still reached up and caught the foul ball, right? Yeah. All right, go ahead. So what, what those verses in Philippians 4, you know, it kind, of, kind of brings to my mind is, you know, the, he tells us to think on these things and to practice these things. I think the choices that we make He couldn't quite carry it through. He passed off the baby to, to Jody. She, she had to take it from him. All right. Um, I had a camper say to me this last week, it's really hard for me to do the wrong things here. Right? And that's the idea that you're saying. When we're surrounded by people who are like-minded and we're doing good and wholesome things together, it's really hard to do the wrong things. Okay? Willie?
Don't say 24. It's not Psalm 24, is it? No. Okay, good, because that's in my notes. We're going to go there later. All right, and what was the verse reference again? Let me say it out loud for everybody. Psalm what? 119, verses 47. Okay. Psalm 119, verses 47 and 48. All right, thank you. Okay. Now, let's go back to Philippians 4, because I want you to see that Paul makes this point, that what we consume, what, what, what we internalize, is what comes out. Paul makes that point in Philippians 4, and verses 8 and 9. So he says in verse 8, here are all of these things that we should dwell on. In other words, they should be internalized. These are the things that we should consume. And then in verse 9, he says, Do what you have learned and received and heard from me and seen in me, and the God of peace will be with you. Do it. Here's what you've internalized. Now do it. Do the things that you've heard and seen and so forth. Some of your translations say practice. Incidentally, if you're wondering, I'm reading from the the Christian Standard Bible, the CSB. This is a Bible that I'm uh, toying with this year. I'm I'm reviewing this. Um, I don't mean that in like an official way. Nobody cares about my opinion. I'm personally reviewing it is what I mean. I was sent a review copy and I'm working through this um, and I'll be happy to share my thoughts with you thus far. But if you're wondering, hey, Ben's translation's not reading the way mine is, That's why. I'm reading from a different Bible today. Verse 8, thoughts. Verse 9, actions. Practice. Do it. You see that? What we consume is what will come out. I think it's interesting in verse 9 that Paul uses these words. The things that you have learned, received, heard, and seen. Those are interesting words that he chooses. We learn that which we receive. I never learned advanced calculus because I didn't want to receive it. I did not care about learning advanced calculus, okay? But I receive, if I want to learn something, I'm going to receive it, and I receive that which I see and hear. So he says, the things that you've seen and heard in me, receive those, learn those things. And of course, the greatest content that we can consume is that which comes from God, the Scripture. But there are other forms of content that are wholesome. TV shows, most of them from the 1950s. Movies. I used to say the Hallmark Channel. That's kind of changing, isn't it? Yeah, I I can hear it. Mm, Right? There's some things that are changing there. They're introducing some things that just uh, five or six years ago they would not have have introduced. Um, There are various forms of music that can be Great, very good, wholesome, uplifting kinds of things. So not, you know, I I know we preachers kind of get up and we rail about bad things in the media and all that, and we say, it's all bad, you know. It's not all bad. There's some good stuff that's out there, but a lot of it is bad. So we have to be, uh, we have to be discerning on that. All right, let's do another exercise. I want you to, I I want you to, I'm going to propose some hypothetical Um, situations, okay? And I want you to give me in one or two words a response, all right? What will my attitude and my actions be if, okay, that's the question that I want you to answer. What will my attitude and my actions be if I watch the news 24-7? Worry? Depression? Okay? Okay. Yeah. What will my attitude and my actions be if I listen to talk radio constantly? Anger, fear, cynicism, pessimism. Yeah. If I watch the stock market open and close every single trading day, what will be my attitude and my actions? What? Panic. Panic. Yeah. We're down 22% this year. Hello. Hello. Anxiety? Yeah. What will be my attitude and my actions if I am regularly looking at inappropriate things on the internet? 
All right? Lust, carnal, carnal things, uh, warped thinking, potentially leading to illicit behavior. There's danger there. What will be my attitude and my actions if I am constantly looking at social media and making comparisons between myself and others? How will I feel about my body? Insecure? Shame? Right? Oh, I can't measure up to her, right? That, that is something that I, I, think, I, I think we need to be exploring. Uh, particularly parents of, of uh, young girls, um, young ladies. We're, we're into some areas here because of social media and the images that are put forth. Um, we're, we're into some areas of, of difficulty here. And I think there's a lot of young women who are really struggling with this. Um, if I'm constantly looking at other people's best lives, right, on social media, and I think, oh, this is the way they live all the time. Could a lack of contentment become a problem for me? Oh, look at all the nice things they have. Look at the, oh, man, these people just go on vacation all the time. Their life is just one big fun, you know, trip. But what will be my attitude and my actions if I listen to Godly things like hymns and spiritually edifying songs or sermons and other Bible messages. Does that have a change on my attitude? Does that have a change on what's, yeah. Or what if I, um, what if I listen to and, and watch more positive programs that encourage and uplift? What does that do for my attitude? What does that do for my actions? I mean, to ask these questions, is, 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 uh, the answer is obvious, right? And yet, most of the media platforms that are out there are pushing which kind of messages? The ones that build us up, the ones that um, make us feel good about ourselves. And, and I don't mean in a sappy Joel Osteen way, but I mean in a genuine good kind of a way, right? Or are they producing the messages that are all about just bad <laughs> In, in, in all kinds of, of ways, just bad, whether it's, you know, violence and uh, aggressive behavior, whether it's something that's overly sexualized or whatever it may be, it's bad. That's what it seems most people are after. So what goes in will affect what comes out. I think about all these young people who are responsible for these school shootings and things like that that are happening. This may not be the only factor, but I do think a large factor in these things is what we're talking about this morning. The kinds of messages that they're receiving, the, the things that they're thinking on. And, I mean, everybody immediately jumps to, like, violent video games and see that's why they're doing it but it's much bigger than that it, it's not just that kind of uh, of specific thing a lot of these kids are dealing with anxiety and fear and depression in serious ways uh, a lot of these kids uh, are are hearing messages that life doesn't matter and that life is not something that's valuable and, and intrinsically holy and sanctified. And all of these messages that they're hearing, they converge. And it comes out in these kinds of behaviors. Paul calls attention here to our minds and then to our actions. And the Bible does this in many, many places. James 4 and verse 8, he says, Cleanse your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts, you double-minded. Cleanse your hands. It's your actions, your outward. Cleanse your hands and purify your hearts. The hands and the heart, they go together. In Psalm 24, we'll look at this one. Psalm 24, <coughs> verses 3 and 4. This is where I thought Willene was going to go earlier. I thought she was going to steal my point. Psalm 24 
Verse 3, who may ascend the mountain of the Lord and who may stand in his holy place? The one who has clean hands and a pure heart, who has not appealed to what is false and who has not sworn deceitfully. He has clean hands and a pure heart. You see, again, those two things go together. Look at Proverbs 4. Verse 21. Well, let's start at verse 20. My son, pay attention to my words. Listen closely to my sayings. Don't lose sight of them. Keep them within your heart. For they are life to those who find them and health to one's whole body. Guard your heart above all else, for it is the source of life. Don't let your mouth speak dishonestly, and don't let your lips talk deviously. Let your eyes look forward. Fix your gaze straight ahead. Carefully consider the path for your feet, and all your ways will be established. Do you see how he started off talking about the heart? And then he transitioned to the mouth and the path that your feet walk on. What comes in will come out. And so Paul says that by filling our minds with good things and then living accordingly, the God of peace will be with us. Yes, ma'am. Okay, all right, good comment. Thank you. Anybody else? Ronnie? That's right. Good. All right, Dan? Right. Yeah. Yeah. Um, the, the things that you've learned and received, you know, heard and seen, those, those are things that, that came from me, he says. But I like the way you said it, though, that he's telling them to model who he is in Christ, not, not who he is without Christ, but who he is because of Christ. Uh, and that takes us back to earlier chapters. Okay, thank you, everybody. Um, I think we've got, yeah, we wrap it up next week, Lord willing. Thank you.